again, in this concept of restoration that we're talking about. It starts with leaders, and leaders need to get back to purity. It's so easy to get caught up in the busyness of, we could just say, whatever it is that you're doing. If you're in some kind of leadership, you get so busy working so hard, and that you sometimes can forget what it's all about. You can get distracted. You can get corrupted. You can get away from what you're really meant to be doing. And Passover is a time for leaders, is a time for those be they spiritual leaders, would they be, be they leaders in government, be they leaders in any place in society. It is a time for us to be restored to purity. And friends, I pray you take advantage of this. Even in this unique time that we have, that many of us are, are home a lot more than we normally are, and we're together with family, and it's it's time for us to get purified again. I pray that you, you would pray for the leaders as well. Just pray that all the leaders throughout the body of Christ, throughout the world, that during this time, it would be a time of purification. It would be a time of checking the hearts and, and allowing the people to get back on track to get back to the way that they are supposed to be. Amen. The Lord is desiring that the leaders, and many of you are leaders or are called to be leaders, and God is saying it's important that you always keep the purity. You always keep it. We know some people that started very pure. But as things grow, as life happens and more opportunities, more recognition, you get established, it's easy, all too easy to lose that purity. And God is wanting to restore the purity. Ultimately, everything we do is for the Lord. Ultimately, Ultimately, we want to please Him with our lives. In every place of leadership, it actually says in the Scripture that not many of you should uh, aspire to those uh, positions of leadership. You shouldn't, uh, everybody shouldn't say, I need to be a leader, I need to be, I need me, 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 because there is a stricter judgment upon us. There is a higher level of responsibility. But thank the Lord for the people who are willing, they are willing to take that responsibility, willing to take it seriously, and are allowing the Lord to restore purity to them. And this is what needed to happen in this time of restoration. They needed to get the, the leaders needed to get back to the place that they never should have left. But thank the Lord that He is full of mercy and love and He brings them back. Amen. You know, one thing about the world and dare I say too much of the body of Christ, there so quick to throw people away, so quick to discount people. And I never want that to be the case in our ministry. It says that love in 1 Corinthians 13 believes the best. And we want to believe the best for all people. It also says in Hebrews, I believe it's chapter 6, it says the blood 
of Jesus Christ speaks better things of you. Not judgment, not, uh, not corruption. Speaks better things. We believe the blood of Jesus Christ speaks better things. And for the leaders. And is restoring the leaders, not just to purity, but restoring the leaders to the presence, the presence of God. So may we never get so busy that we don't have time to be in the presence of God. And this is an opportunity with where we are right now. I mean, Passover in general is great for this, but this specific Passover is very powerful because there's not as many distractions. One uh, man of God, I saw him post on Facebook, he said, your soccer stadiums or any athletic event, all canceled. Your music concerts, all canceled. Your theatrical events, all canceled. Your cinema, closed down. dare I say, even some churches that can be a distraction, can be entertainment more than actually bringing people to the presence of God. But what God is wanting to do, He's wanting to bring the leaders, bringing the people back to his presence, back to what it's all about. It's about connecting with the Lord. And that's what God wanted. He wanted the people to appear before him. He wanted the people to present themselves to him. That's what part of what Passover is. It's one of the three times during the year where they were to present themselves before the Lord in Jerusalem. And he was restoring leadership. He was restoring the, the priests. He was restoring the governmental leaders. He was restoring these people to a place, not just of purity, but a place of his presence. Because it's in his presence everything makes sense. It's in his presence that we find strength. It's in his presence that things turn around. It's in his presence that so many powerful things happen. And that's where the men and women of God are going to receive strength. They're going to receive guidance. That's where the anointing is found. And not just for the preachers, the spiritual leaders, but for those that have leadership. They all need the presence of God. They all need the anointing of God. And so God is restoring leadership. Passover is to be a time of restoration. And it's restoring leadership, yes, to purity, yes, to presence, but even to the procedures of God. And when we say procedures, we mean God's way of doing things. And God had a certain way that the Passover was to be. And it said they had not followed it for some time. Not just the people, but the leaders. But isn't it powerful? This is something so important, is that if we can get the leaders in a good place, 
it's a lot easier to get the people in a good place. I've seen this time and time again. How important leadership is. How important it is to have somebody who's willing to lead others, who's willing to help others and show them the way. Amen? And so God, during Passover, wants to restore leadership. He wants them to understand not just the procedures of Passover. We're not concerned about all the specifics of that. But we're talking about the procedures, the directions that God has, learning to do it His way. And God is helping leadership to get back to that. And I say to all the leaders, all the leaders, you might be connected with us, you might not be, allow this to be a time where you would go through great restoration, just as it happened in the days of Hezekiah. May it happen now. I believe God is going to do that. Amen. So it's restoring the leadership, but it's also restoring the apostates. You say, what is that? Restoring the ones that had left God. The restoring the unfaithful, restoring the ones that, that had backslidden, who had turned away from God. And in the letter that the king sent to the people, so much wisdom. And he was telling them to be restored from the place where they were faithless, from faithlessness, meaning they had not been faithful, meaning they had not believed the Lord, they had not followed the ways of God. And actually, this is so powerful. He sent this, not just to the southern kingdom, which was under his rule, but he sent it up to the northern kingdom. He sent it up to the neighbors who were also the covenant people of God. He sent this up to the people that for 200 years had been under a curse of idolatry, had been in rebellion against God. And they had not been faithful to God. So much so that there was a prophet who spoke unto them named Hosea. And Hosea spoke to them in the northern kingdom. And he lived through, we could say, a nightmare in his house. God told him, you are a man of God. You are my servant. You're going to get married. And he said, oh, amen, hallelujah, praise the Lord. He was excited, amen, hallelujah. What a blessing to get married. It is a blessing. He who finds a wife finds favor from God. And imagine he's thinking, oh, wow, praise the Lord, that's going to be really good. But God said, there she is, take her. And he looked. And she seemed to be a little bit wild. She seemed to be not the right choice, but I guess he said, God, I trust you. And so Hosea took the woman named Gomer. He took her into his home. They were married. They became husband and wife. But this woman kept sneaking out of the house and kept cheating on her husband, kept being unfaithful to him, going after other men, going after other things, even prostitution and perversion and all kinds of evil that she was doing. And this man was crying out to God. And he said, these children that she's pregnant with, I don't even think they're mine. 
you know? But he would raise them anyway. He would teach them anyway. He would always try to be there for his wife. But she was faithless. She was unfaithful. And God said, this is what my nation is doing. They are faithless. They're not doing what they should. But God raised up the king, Hezekiah. And Hezekiah sent the word to them and said, don't be faithless any longer. I, I'm wanting to restore you from the place of apostasy, a place where you turn from God. I'm wanting to return you to life with God. And so he's calling out to the people. And he said, don't be faithless any longer. And then he said, don't be stiff-necked. Or don't be stubborn. Don't be hard-hearted. He said, many of them had gotten hard-hearted. And because it had been a long time, it had become a new tradition not to follow God, but to follow false idols and all of the things that Jeroboam had started. And they had followed it and they'd gotten stubborn and they wouldn't change it. And they wouldn't change it. But he said, it's time to leave that hard-hearted, stubborn place. And God is calling out, even in the time of Passover, to restore those who once had a love for God, who once were connected with God. They were once the covenant people, and they still uh, were considered covenant people, but they were faithless, they were hard-hearted, they were stubborn. But God is wanting to restore them. God was wanting to bring them back to that place. But it says, what did many of them do when they received this word? Because they had been faithless and stubborn, they started mocking. They started mocking Hezekiah, started mocking this. Oh, that's so stupid. Oh, that's so mad. But that's what the enemy does. That's what he tries to get people to do when God wants to restore them. God wants to bring life to them. They'll mock it. You know, some people are mocking or attacking, criticizing, doing jokes about it, but in their heart, they know. In their heart, they know. That God is calling to them. And God was calling in this time to those. And I believe God's calling to those kind of people. Amen. And I pray that that's not us. But, but we've got to be careful because it can start with a little seed. It can start with a little thing where you're not believing. You're not trusting. You're not on fire for God. You're starting to get a hard heart. And you start mocking. See, there's a place for everything. There's a place for all kinds of fun and jokes and joy. And all the things like that. There's a place for that. And I thank God for it. But there's also a time when the mocking is leading you away from God. And God was calling them from that was calling them out of that in this time of Passover. Passover was a time for them to be restored back to God. Passover was a time for them to get right with God. And it said some of them had gotten so far that they were in a place of desolation. They were in such a deep, and dark place, such a miserable place, 
And I tell you, when you turn from God, you're not happy. You're miserable. Ultimately, that's what you are. Because true joy and true peace is only found in the Lord. I know a lot of people can have seemingly good lives, and I'm okay, that's just fine. But once you have had experience with the Lord, if you're far from Him, you'll never be happy. You'll never be satisfied. You won't. You'll be miserable, as many of these were. But He was calling them from that place. The King was calling them. God was calling them. It's time to be restored. It's time to get out of this. Amen? But not only was he restoring leadership, not only was he restoring the apostates, but he was restoring the altar. He was restoring the place where people could meet with God. And in this time, what God is wanting to do, I'm not just talking about the Passover of these days, but I'm talking about today. They were restoring the place where they could meet with God. And God is saying, my altar is being restored. Let my altar be restored in this time of Passover. Let it be restored so that you can connect with me so you can find mercy. If you, if you see what Hezekiah was doing, he was crying out for mercy for the people. He said, may the good Lord pardon everyone who sets his heart to seek God. And even though they're, they're trying, they were missing it. They weren't doing everything the right way. They were falling down. And remember, those of you who are connected with our ministry, you've heard me say this, and I'll say it again and again and again, and I pray that it would so burn inside your heart, burn inside your mind, that you might fall down but you get back up. Because the righteous might fall down seven times and seven times he gets back up. And that's not meaning after the eighth time you never get back up. No, he, some say that was in one day. And it doesn't matter how many times you fall down, how many times you miss it. We, we believe God for mercy. And at his altar is mercy. There's actually a place that was on the Ark of the, of the Covenant where the angels, uh, the cherubim, they were formed out of gold and, and they, they had their wings up in such a way and then they were in a place that looked like they were either sitting or, or kneeling and at that place it made what looked like a seat and this became known as the mercy seat. And years ago in a revival that took place in, in Florida, this was the song that they would play at the altar call. And it says, I'm running, I'm running, I'm running to the mercy seat. I remember being in services when they started singing that song. It was a powerful anointing that you can find mercy. You can find mercy. You can find mercy. No matter how much you've messed up, and how much, he said, just set your heart to seek the Lord. Say, Lord, I want you. Amen. In this time of restoration, you're, he's restoring this place where we can meet with him. And he said, He's restoring the altar for mer mercy, that we might find mercy. But he's also restoring the altar for 
yielding. He said yield or surrender to the Lord. And the altar is a place where you surrender your life to him. And many have forgotten about this. Many feel like, no, I just do whatever I want. Or I live what we call a light Christian life. Like a diet or like a light, you know, where we don't take it seriously. We don't do everything the way we should. We do the light version. But Passover is a time to restore the altar, to restore the place where you go and you yield and you surrender everything to Him. Everything. In this time, in this season that we're in, will you surrender your will? Will you surrender your dreams? Will you surrender surrender all of your life and what you do at the altar is you put yourself on the altar you are the sacrifice it says in Romans chapter 12 verse 1 that we're to present ourselves as living sacrifice to the Lord we are to say, here is my life. Here I am, O oh Lord. I am your sacrifice for yielding to him, surrender to him. But not only surrender, but you get up from that place and you will then, as he talked about, here, the man of God, the King Hezekiah, he said, and then from that place that you will serve the Lord, you will obey the Lord. So the altar is being restored for mercy that you receive, for yielding, but also for obedience. He's restoring the altar, and this time, so that we might obey him. You know, we feel like, oh, it doesn't matter. Oh, I know God wants us to do this, but ah, I'm not going to do it. It's okay. It's okay. It's okay. It's okay. It's okay. It's okay. No, it's not okay. It's not okay for you to say no to the Lord. It's not okay when God puts a leader in place and God is directing this leader and you say, no, I'm not going to listen to him. I'm not going to do what they say. I'm just going to do what I want to do. And you're not obeying the Lord and you're not obeying the ones that he put in your life to help you. Remember one time we were taking a person through discipleship and teaching them the things of God. And when I started talking about this, the person left and never came back. Ooh, Pastor. Whoa. Well, maybe you shouldn't talk about that. How can I not talk about it? Another time I was still in Brazil. We were talking about this. We were talking about not gossiping, not being rebellious talked about having pure hearts and, and, and following leadership. And a bunch of them went away too. You say, ooh. ooh. But the altar is a place where after we receive mercy, surrender to the Lord we then begin to move in obedience and he said obedience is better than sacrifice and people think well 
I'll just do whatever I want. It's okay. 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 Uh-uh. He said, well, what do you mean? You mean that, that, uh, that God is, is not saving me anymore? I don't get into that argument all the time. Some people say, oh, I, I'm not saved anymore. Because, and what I would say is, you don't want to find out. That's the wrong question. You don't want to see how much can I disobey God and still be saved. That's really foolish. It doesn't make sense. Why would you want to? Why would you not want to obey God? Do you know His laws are perfect? His ways are perfect. Don't you know He has what's best for you? Amen. And so, in the place of the altar, He's restoring obedience. He's restoring people that will follow him, that will be serious. And what was the last thing that we read? Hezekiah cried out and interceded for the people. And it says, the Lord heard the man of God, the leader, the king, Hezekiah, and he healed the people. So the altar is a place to be healed. The altar is a place to be healed in your heart. If your heart's not right, it's a place for him to heal your heart, to heal your mind, to heal the inner part of you. And it's also a place for you to be healed physically too you're dealing with sickness and some sickness is because people have turned away from God. Some things happen as a consequence of not following God. Other times there are attacks that come, there's different challenges we face in this world. You know, I always say when something happens we need to run to God. And ask him what's going on. But sometimes people get sick because they're not following God. Oh, no, 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 no. That doesn't happen today. Oh, God would never do that. Well, essentially, he's letting you choose what you want. You don't want God? You want to be without him? That's a consequence. But he's restoring the altar so that people can find healing. These people were healed. Amen. This was an incredible time of restoration. And I believe that God wants this Passover, this season that we're in, to be an incredible time of restoration. He wants to restore. He wants us to get back to the place he has for us. And I want you to pray with me for the leaders. Some of you are leaders. Or some of you God is wanting to restore you to a place of leadership. Maybe you left it. Maybe you abandoned it. Maybe you thought it was too hard. But God is saying, I need you. The people need you. This world needs you. I remember in some of the more difficult times, some of the stuff not to get in the details right now, but there were injustices. There were things that, you know, you would say, what's wrong with some of these people? But the Lord told me the people need you. Persevere through this. I'll take care of you. 
the people need you. And I said, yes, Lord. I'll continue to lead. I'll continue to do what you called me to do. And the Lord, right now, is restoring leaders. Will you pray with me? It's easy to judge them. It's easy to throw them away and discount them. God does it. It's been said that the church is the only army that shoots its wounded. That we attack the ones that, that get hurt, the ones that fall down, the ones that make mistakes, the ones that sin. We attack them, we shoot them instead of restoring them. But God wants to restore even leaders He's calling them to purity. I pray, Lord, even in the midst of this quarantine and the shutdowns and the curfews and the limitations, that you would use this to bring your leaders back to purity. And I pray for purity, even for the governmental leaders, I know there's some agendas. I know there's some corruption. I know there's some strings trying to be pulled and people want to use this. As some of them have said, never waste a crisis. We're trying to do what we want to do. We're going to use this for our agendas and things. Father, I pray that you would so shake the people. Shake the leaders. they would see your fire and they would say we need to find purity. We do not want to be in a place of judgment that would be pure. And Lord, that we would believe that you can do that. That you can either make the leaders pure or you can replace them with those that have true purity. And Lord, we as leaders can get so busy, so preoccupied, so distracted, so uh, filled with so many other things that we miss your presence. Restore your leaders to your presence to the intimate relationship with you to walking with you to knowing you to loving you restore them oh God restore them restore them restore them and restore them Lord to your procedures to your way of doing things some of them have taken shortcuts, tried to do it their own way, or the way that other people say is good, the popular way, the easy way, the seeker-sensitive way, or the way that benefits them, but it violates what you have said. Lord, restore them to your procedures. And Father, we're praying for those that have gotten far from you. We're praying for the apostates. We're praying for those that have become faithless. They don't have faith. I don't believe. Lord, restore them back to the faith they used to have, 
to the trust they used to have, to the devotion they used to have. And Lord, break through the stubbornness, the hard-heartedness, where they will not turn, where they will not listen. They become apathetic. Lord God, restore them from that place. Get them out of that place. Back to you. And Lord, those that become mockers and critical, we pray, O oh Lord, that you would restore them. Get them out of that place. They realize they shouldn't be mocking what you're doing. Shouldn't be mocking your word. Shouldn't be mocking the opportunities that you give. Lord, get them out of that place. Father, I pray you'd have mercy on the mockers. You'd have mercy on the critics. My wife was talking about some of them attacking the, the uh, president, the vice president, and the different things they're doing, looking to find fault and to mock and attack. Lord God. Help them to repent. And Lord, from the place of desolation, a place of death and darkness and defeat, you're saying, I can restore you. I can bring you to life again. I can bring you to hope again. I can turn your situation totally around. We sing it all the time here. He's the God of the turn of all. The time of restoration. The restore. Restore. And restore your people as you restore the altar. And that in the altar they would find mercy. They would find that they don't pay for their sins. You've paid for their sins. And you receive them. You allow them to come in. And Father, we pray that they and that we would come to your altar and surrender, offer ourselves on your altar. And that we would then live a life of obedience. And Lord, you would heal, you would heal, you would heal the land, heal the people as only you can do. Do it, Lord. Father, we cry out for restoration. We cry out for restoration for your people. Make your church come alive again. Make our nations come alive again. You'll restore the nations to what you created them to be. Not what many times they have become. We were uh, watching about Ireland and watching about what St. Patrick did, the man of God did to so impact and transform that nation. That nation has a purpose. We pray that purpose would be fulfilled. There's a purpose over our nation. There's a purpose over the United States. There's a purpose over Brazil. There's a purpose over Argentina. There's a purpose over the nations of Africa and the other nations of Europe. There's a purpose over these places. Lord, that you would restore, 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 restore. Restore, Lord. You'll do it for the praise of your glory. We believe you. 
In Jesus' name. In Jesus' mighty name. Hallelujah. God bless us. Bless each one of you. It's a great night. Amen. We'll be back tomorrow. One more time. One more time. And then as we finish this holy time of Passover. Amen. God bless you. Remember also we have other programs, other things going on. Amen. Uh, we actually have something for those of you part of uh, Sunrise National Church, so our local ministry. We will have a um, small group, raised small group. You can come either on Friday at 7.30 or, sun, or Saturday, excuse me, at 6.30 p.m. And then Sunday we'll be online like we have been. Okay, and hopefully soon we'll be able to get back. We're praying for that. We're praying for our nation. We're praying that this coronavirus is falling. And it is falling in Jesus' name. Well, God bless each and every one of you. And know that the sun is rising. And the sun is rising in me. And we're rising together in this sun. God bless you. We love you. Bye-bye.